first question I want to start out with is how did you both get involved with the project? Did you come up with the idea of pairing these bands up or did it just get thrust upon you? You start. Well, it, you know, it's a rather unconventional way of, uh, of the film coming out, coming together. Um, I certainly, I think for, for me, it was a little different to the way that you normally work. Um, the film started as an idea. I, I'm the creative director at a creative agency called uh, Greenlight. And we specialise in sort of music-oriented creative ideas, you know, films, TV shows, that sort of thing. And um, Hyundai had approached us um, and they wanted to do something interesting and culturally relevant within music for the launch of their new car, which is the Hyundai Veloster. And um, we came up with a bunch of different ideas and presented them uh, to Hyundai and they fell in love, uh, as we all did, with the idea of regeneration. Uh, which is a film about you know, young people and DJs reinventing traditional genres of music. Um, we went from there then quite quickly into production um, and we started to bring artists in. You know, we started to look at different artists, um, different DJs that we felt were going to create an interesting sort of milieu, if you like. You know, so obviously, there's a lot of different genres within DJ culture. You know, Hip hop, you've got Mark Ronson, which is slightly more of a, uh, a producer style DJ, and then obviously Skrillex, which is dubstep, and, and uh, Crystal Method, and, uh, and Pretty Lights, which are obviously more electronica. Um, and our, one of our first choices for uh, director was me. Well, our, our first choice was Scorsese, Scorsese, Scorsese out of Spielberg. Um, <laughs> no, our first choice was. <laughs> Their first the, choice was Leanne Rimes. Had you seen oh, the Tillman <laughs> Project? What? Yeah. Had you seen the Tillman Project before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But what they didn't know, though, what they didn't know was that I had a, a DJ pilot set up at a now defunct cable network some pilot. many years ago. Yeah, pilot for a television show, and uh, and uh, it was it was a lousier version of this idea. It was like it <clears throat> it wouldn't have probably worked as a as an entertaining TV show, reality but show? And it wasn't a reality show. They were trying; the execs were trying to make it into a reality show. Of course, and it's funny because with DJs, you know, cred is extraordinarily important. And so I had done all this work, you know, systematically uh, making these guys comfortable with me, and you know, making inroads and letting them know that I was going to make something serious about music, and and then the network changed hands and uh, all the executives, new executives came in and they said, okay, great, we still we still want to do the DJ show even though we've changed format a little bit, but it's got to be very men friendly. So, you know, you have Mixmaster Mike of the Beastie Boys as your, as your host, what we need is a scantily clad woman. And uh, so I had to go to him and say, sorry man, I, they're making me get a woman in there. And then, you know, he had to go to this, it, all of a sudden I had to go back to all these DJs. Yeah, I had to go all, all these DJs and tell them like, Literally, what's important now is like fire breathing and you know, uh, spectacle, yeah. not what, what a great DJ. I had Hubert and all these people, anyway. So, that was many years back. And then, when these guys called me, I had this great moment of, of realization that oh my god, this, this idea for me is going to finally come to fruition. And that was kind of another reason yeah. why, for us, you know, Maria <coughs> was perfect for this. You know, not only you know, his commitment to. Authenticity and you know the stories that he's already put together, um, but for us, like his approach, the way that when we first spoke about the project, his passion for music was one of the things that we're like we have to we have to get this guy. He's awesome, um, and uh, working together has been incredibly rewarding. Were there acts that you had wanted originally to be <coughs> that couldn't be in due to maybe time constraints or just? Um, in the beginning, there was there were. I'm trying to think back now. I mean, when we went through this sort of decision-making process for the, you know, initially for the DJs, like I said, we wanted to try and have, have a sort of wider array of DJs that weren't just going to be in one specific niche. Um, there was actually a funny, fun moment where I may have first signed on. It was like, I want to do it. You know, I want to be involved. And we were, um, and we were in a, the first production meeting, I think, that we had. Because things moved quite quickly after we got the green light. It was like, okay, we're going into production. Let's get all the DJs signed. Let's get our director in. 
let's let's figure out how we're going to make this because you know our launch window was you know at that point was somewhere yeah. in October and we had like three months to get everything together. It was well, let me, let me, this, so change. I'll say it from my perspective. This is kind of funny, and he doesn't know it. So uh, you know. Um, so like you know, they said. So what do you know about DJ culture? And I said that's. I told them, you know, yeah, I know a lot about DJ culture. But the funny thing is, I'm kind of at this point, I'm like an old fart. Like what I call DJ culture is it's it's different. You know, I mean, now I'm up to pretty much up to speed. But you know, at the time when we were having our initial so conversation, you still like a turntableist from. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Days. Yeah, and then I mean, some some electronica, but I didn't. I honestly like I didn't even know who Skrillex was basically. I mean, I heard the name. Um, he grew up in one year. Yeah, but we, we but like I was googling on our initial calls. I was like, yeah, oh great, yeah, pretty lights, <laughs> yeah, like so, and uh, and then so so I had that kind. Of, I was in that kind of mode of like, okay, these are new guys. I'm gonna be doing catch up, and that's cool, whatever. When I, when when this story that Nick was about to tell happened, I walked in from the airplane to meet these guys, shaking their hands, and they said, it's great timing because we're just about to get on the phone with DJ Premier. And he is somebody I know really well and like go way back with and all this stuff. But somehow, maybe a combination of jet lag, my own spaciness, and sort of being feeling like a little bit on the defensive about like this, elect, like some of these DJs who I don't know, I got then my initial thought is some motherfucking kid stole DJ Premier's name. You know, like I didn't think they had that. So then, I mean, it was just stupid, you know, in retrospect. I noticed you guys used a lot of like, tilt shift techniques, and it looked like tilt shift yeah. in, in the film, but I've never really seen it. Other than anything that's like a above wide shot or anything like that, what, what was the creative choice, or why did you use, choose to use it? Did what just look cool? We'd had a, a bunch of discussions at the beginning yeah, of I mean, this. That's basically. It. Well, I mean, we'd had a kind of a bunch yeah. of discussions at the beginning about wanting to make this film visually different, you know, visually stylish, not just uh, not just motivated by what was happening on screen, like you know, like in a normal documentary, you choose, yeah. I guess tools that are going to allow you to be quick, you know, zooms, stuff like that. We actually sort of made right. a slightly different selection in that we wanted this story to be uh, visually beautiful and stylistic as well as, uh, I guess, utilitarian. I think we, obviously we live in a culture where people have very short attention spans and there's a sense, you know, there's just a need, you get nervous as a media producer, you get nervous that people are going to get bored. Right. But what we try to do is say, like, no, let's let's make something that people won't be bored uh, watching. And, let's, and it doesn't always have to be awkward moments and, you know, interpersonal tension. There is that, of course. Um, but normally when people do music, they rely on that. They rely on, you know, celebrity kind of foibles, like, you know, I mean, like cable TV, usually when they do music, it's not really about music. It's like People Magazine, you know. So it's you know. So we we didn't want to do that. We wanted to say like music is interesting to watch. We as music lovers love to watch people make music, and it is entertaining. But in order to do that, you can't do it with a rinky dinky lens, and you can't do it with you can't just be a fly on the wall. You have to shoot it nicely, and that takes very deliberate kind of production. Yeah, because this was so. even though it was a documentary. You know, the, the story itself, with it being sort of more of an ensemble piece, you know, we made the choice that we were going to create, we were, we were going to have it be a, a slightly more timeless story as yeah. well. It wasn't just like, okay, this is a story about these, exactly these guys right now. It was a story that, you know, had reflections in the past, the way that rock and roll came about, and, you know, every genre of music, certainly when we were doing country. Yeah. We were looking at all the ways that country music had expanded over the years, and you know, bluegrass had come out of it. And, and in fact, that was one of the themes that we initially were looking at doing in the film that we we sort of straight away from. But you know, we we didn't use uh, zoom lenses really. We mainly used prime lenses. Uh, and I think another part of the decision for the tilt shift stuff was, um, you know, these guys were being put in a position that was slightly outside of their comfort zone. You know, where they were kind of these small individuals surrounded by this That's huge right. history of music. You know, so you have, you know, DJ Premier stood in this huge hall yeah. that really represents the, the sort of like cultural history of the traditions of classical music, which is vast. You know, and then you have this DJ uh, who represents what's going on now in culture and the way people feed off of all the different stuff that's come before them. And you know, Tilt Shift Lens does a good job of really right. isolating somebody and sort of making them feel somewhat small, you know, yeah. 
Or and also drawing your attention to certain things, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it was, you know, the way the Thanks for noticing. Yeah. Nobody else asks us that. <laughs> so if you had, uh, you could get anybody out of the whole music spectrum to do a collaboration, no budget concerns or anything like that, and you were, and you were all going to be willing to do it, who would, who would your two mashups be? It would be Jimmy Page and Amir Barlef. <laughs> <laughs> you could maybe, it might get you heard it here first. No budget constraints. Talking to you. You know, it's kind of interesting because I think that you know, you know, part of the magic of a film like you know, of, of, of a film like Regeneration is kind of that meeting point where different things, unexpected results, come out of taking some of these artists outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's one of the things that I, you know, have resonated certainly with my, myself. You know, when you see the trailer for the film, or you hear it, you hear somebody uh, tell you about the film. You know, what's interesting is that people want to see. You know, people want to see what that is going to come out like. What does country music and you know, and you know, pretty lights? How, how how's that going to sound? Yeah, and that was all me on it. When yeah, I saw it in December. and it was it, it, it was very difficult, not just selling it to the, to our audience, but also selling it to the DJs. You know, we had a conversation with uh, Pretty Lights uh, at the very beginning, where you know we had the genres. You know, we, we mapped out the genres and then we, you know, we started to put all the DJs in there. And DJ, you know, uh, and Pretty Lights uh, had country. And I get, you know, I jumped on a call with him and he's saying like, um, Jimmy gospel, I don't want to do that. He did want to do gospel. Yeah. He wanted to do gospel. And I, and I remember saying at the time, I'm like, this could potentially be one of the most interesting of all of the genres. Because I've seen aspects of all of these other genres done before. Yeah. You know, I've seen a bit of classical music and hip hop. I've seen, you know, a little bit of, you know, R and B is is you know in, in the Chemical Brothers. It's in the well, Mark Ronson is doing what he does. Exactly, day. exactly, and, and that's why it works so well with an ensemble that you have all these different kinds of stories. The same with Skrillex and rock. But I, you know, my pitch to him was this is this is the potential to do something that is really really different and that hasn't been done before and potentially could be one of the most sort of striking and interesting tracks in the whole piece. It just seemed like he had a terrible time and I can't, did it, Ralph Stanley even listen to the song? There was a scene that we shot where, not where he listened to the song, but there was a scene that we shot where he listened to Derek's music, yeah, you remember that? that was and it was just a great outtake, we, never, we didn't use it, but it was, it was very similar to the way I think that Ray responded to Skrillex's video yeah. for, for the first time when he heard it, it was that but kind you know, of like blank yeah. expression. I just yesterday heard that Ralph Stanley likes the song and liked the experience and saw the film. Oh, wow. That's great. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same with Martha. You I know, know, I know. Martha so you never guess from watching the film. No, you know, and, but I think that's really to their credit. Yeah, you know, but also, yeah, I mean, the legends. Yeah. I think one of the things that Crystal Method said in the film was really nice about like Martha's, you know, involvement. You know, she's a professional. This is somebody that's been doing this for a long time. Yeah. You know, and I think it's to her credit that she cares a, a much about what she sings, about the lyrics that she sings, and why she would push back. I mean, you know, it's easy to go into someone and just be the yes person and say, yeah, okay, I'll sing that, I'll do that. But these artists, these legendary artists, when you work with great people, they want to bring something to the process. Every single one of the uh, DJs understood whenever there was pushback. From, you know, in this case of John Densmore, in the case yeah. of Skrillex, in the case of Pretty Lights and uh, Ralph Stanley, and in the case of the Crystal Method and Martha, they, they, they very eloquently and, you know, em empathetically explained why they were being given a hard time or whatever, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, be, and because, you know, there, there is a lot of crappy music out there, basically, and these people have been working for a long time, and they want to make sure that there's a human interaction happening, and that these people are kind of, are not there just to kind of uh, take what they, what they, what they've done, and then just make a kind of easily accessible, palatable version of it, you know, for today's, you know, kids. But rather, you know, learn what it is that the person has done, and then, you know, adapt it and build on it. And, you know. and we were very fortunate as well. I mean, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, that I made that was brought to this film, that has made this film so, you know, sort of riveting and, and interesting is just the level of commitment to authenticity and making sure that, you know, I remember interviews with the Crystal Method where, 
Oh, yeah. You know, where, where the guys were like, you know, they were being super polite. They were being too nice. They were being too nice. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, it was, it was difficult and it was this and it was that. And it was like, no, that wasn't what happened in, in, <laughs> in when, we, when we were in so and so. That wasn't what happened at all. Super Tell nice me. Guys all right. super so nice, guys. so nice, yeah. The, but, you know, again, like, you know, all of the DJs uh, <laughs> were great, but I remember a minute just like oh, having these dinner. guys in the, in the room. To his credit, because you it's can't handle the truth. You can't. It was. It was like you can't. No, it's just, just that's not what happened. That it just it's not once. what happened, yeah. and it wasn't. You know, and, and uh, he was able to get them back onto. You know, this is a documentary as well. We're not making uh, a piece of fluff here. We're, we're documenting the creative process, and we we're very fortunate to be able to get in and see these guys be creative in a really, you know, in a way that I don't oh, know if I've seen, yeah. you know, before. Where this. When Nas came in to work on the lyrics, he had never heard the song before. Yeah. From the time our cameras were rolling, he came in the studio, he was there for like, what, four hours, three hours? Uh, yeah. Three or four yeah. hours, he wrote all of the lyrics, it's performed them. Oh, it's right. I mean, the same with Erica Badu. She came into the studio, that first, when, what you see on camera is obviously an edited version, but yeah. that's pretty much how it happened. She came in, oh, and yeah, it is it two, two and a half hours, Never heard it. She, wrote yeah. the, she wrote the lyrics for the song. And not only that, but both, in both of those cases, mm -hmm. they, they asked uh, Premier and Ronson, respectively, so what is this project about? You know, what's the whole thing about? Not just yeah. Sheriff Owen, what's the whole thing about? They got downloaded on it, and then they worked that into their songs. You yeah. know, I mean, yeah. you hear that. Yeah. Like, that yeah. My favorite—I'll tell you one of my favorite moments. Uh, I mean, it, I, it, to me, what actually makes me emotional, or whatever, is the is the Erica Badu coda. You know, where she's saying, "All that we are, all that we yeah. feel." You know, I, uh, so I obviously I love it. I don't even remember how it goes, but I'm still crying. Yeah, no, no, it's just that. it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> She's talking about the theme of the film, you know, she's talking about the gumbo, you know, this that um, made up pieces, put it in a... Put in the pot. Put in the pot, yeah. yeah. How embarrassing. Anyway, trust me, it's a great lyric. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have it for you right now. It comes across, I think, in the film. I hope it does. It certainly does for me. I mean, because I remember when we were going through the edit process and trying to get all these scenes to work together as, as an ensemble piece, there were genuinely moments where, you know, you know, I, I get very emotional in the film, certainly with DJ Premier and some of those moments, you know, because they're very moving moments where you see the creative process really stripped back. And I think that that's, uh, that's, that's kind of uh, special, certainly for me.